Futures Radio Show, sponsored by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world effectively manage risk. For access to free educational tools and resources for the active individual trader, please visit activetrader.cmegroup.com. Every day, traders and investors dive in to tackle the ever-changing markets to find opportunity. Futures Radio Show is your number one source for answers to the questions that all market participants want to ask. Veteran futures trader Anthony Crudelli sits down with the most influential leaders and top traders in the industry. Now, here's your host, Anthony Crudelli. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in for this episode with Chris Weston. Remember, new shows are posted on Mondays and Thursdays. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes and YouTube. If you're enjoying the show, please leave a review on iTunes. Before I play today's interview for you, I want to give a shout out to the great sponsors of Futures Radio Show. See Me Group, Trading Technologies, FTSE Russell, RJO Futures, and Top Step Trader. To learn more about these sponsors and the important things they are doing for Futures Traders, be sure to click on their logos on FuturesRadioShow.com. Today, I spoke with the head of research at Pepperstone, Chris Weston. We kicked off today's show with Chris explaining his process for identifying a macro theme, how he decides which markets to trade based off of that theme, how he uses technical analysis and implied volatility to manage his risk, and last but not least, we discussed the simple process of doing more of what works and less of what doesn't. So without further ado, let me take you right to the interview with Chris. Chris, what do you consider your style of trading? My style is very much uh, macro discretionary. I'm a big picture guy. I'm thinking about what's making move, markets move. I want to know why something's going from going to A to B. I want to know about the quality of the journey. Um, I, I obviously make decisions for myself. Um, you know, I've toyed with the idea of going systematic at some stage, but very much at this stage, um, yeah, everything I do is is driven by my mind, thoughts and beliefs, my own um, interpretation of the news, how I control my feelings and control my emotions when I enter and exit the trade. So, yeah, completely macro discretionary, uh, although, you know, some of the, the, the trades that I do run are very much event driven as well. But ultimately, you know, I'm looking big picture. Uh, and I'm I'm thinking about the thematics that are playing out in, in global markets, and I'm looking for the instruments there, uh, which are the best way to express those, not just from a cost perspective, but are actually, you know certainly the most sensitive to those those underlying themes that you're seeing in markets. Why did you choose this style of trading? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it's something that I'm interested in. I think that's a really good place to start. <laughs> um, I, I love trying to work out the interconnectivity of, of, of financial markets. For example, you know, if, if, if a central bank is saying one thing, what happens to bond markets? What happens to the, the, the shape and contour of the yield curve? What does that mean to currencies? Uh, what do currencies mean for things like gold and, and, and various factors like that? So, you know, how yeah, we started sort of getting in a number of years ago, really into the interconnectivity, the, the intermarket analysis. And uh, and really, I found it fascinating just to understand, you know, how things were, you know, had the relationships with each other, the sort of coefficients that you saw between those those markets. And really, sort of, it stemmed from, you know, a, a number of high level factors. Uh, we look at political risk, we look at economic growth risks, the offset, therefore, what happens from central banks, liquidity in markets. You've got these overriding factors that, that really come through. And then the markets are, are obsessed you know, with, with understanding what's going to happen um, from a central bank action, from a political action. Is it binary? Is it non-binary? And then ultimately, when, when you can understand those really high-level thematics, um, you're looking at those th the, the, the themes that are sort of transcending from that and trying to understand what are the uh, sort of markets that are going to move as a result of potential changes uh, and ultimately what is the best way to express that. So for me, it was really sort of getting into an idea of, of how interconnected markets were uh, and, and having a really good uh, and forming a, a, what I believe is, is a tight uh, sort of macro oversight of, of policy and then really developing a, a sort of a technical structure that works in, in sort of parallel with that. So for me, it's a really a strategy which is about probability. 
Um, when you can understand the macro and understand what markets you, you want to trade and how they're related to each other, uh, and when you can select uh, a vehicle to trade that, that, that thematic, it's really about then um, deploying a sort of technical overlay and trying to understand the ebb and flow of the market and whether the market is actually aligned with what you're trying to say. If you can get those two together, um, that's where I'm looking at a higher probability setup. Then we sort of go into the next strategy, which, of course, is your risk management and, and position sizing and various factors. But for me, I was always fascinated about you know, how markets were related to each other and what was the ultimately the big ticket item that was driving those markets. And when you can understand that, you know, it can be quite a powerful concept. So it's a macro theme. Then you look at some technicals and then, like you mentioned, risk management, just to summarize it. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as you say, they're really understanding what is driving markets or trying to understand what is driving markets. Um, ultimately, then selecting, uh, having a view on where things are likely to go, um, having a, a view on um, what is the right vehicle to express that? What is the cleanest vehicle? What is the most sensitive to that thematic? And then ultimately, when you've taken a view, seeing if the market agrees with you. You know, for me, if I believe that dollar yen's going up for whatever reason, there might be a steeper curve, real yields might be going up. I'm not going to be looking to to trade that um, unless the sort of technicals and the price action suggest that happens as well. So I'm trying to combine a sort of a macro overlay with then with a, with the ebb and feel of of the market. If that's aligned, then we can progress through to the next stage, which of course is understanding volatility in markets, which allows me to understand my risk. How much risk I'm taking on will allow me how you know my position size, and then we've got a trade. The question then, of course, is how you manage that trade when you're in there. So that's the kind of process in it's selection, technicals, position sizing, and then managing the trade when I'm in there. All right. Well, let's dissect your process. Let's start with identifying a macro theme. How do you go about that? Where does it all begin? Right. Well. I think you, you, you're always sort of looking at, I mean, you know, I think the media uh, and, and everything you're seeing out there, you know, research you're seeing from sell side, people, you know, actually having a look at prices in itself is you, you're trying to identify that, that overriding theme. You, you take, take the situation which is going on now and, you know, it's really about whether or not, you know, we're going to see a recession in the US and, and globally. And people have pared back some of those expectations for whatever reason. Um, and, and we're looking now at the idea that you're seeing a repricing of markets, a repricing of the idea that the world's not so bad. There's a lot of positioning which has gone into duration assets, you know, flattening of the curves throughout most of this year. And that's being unwound pretty aggressively. So we're trying to understand what's caused that. We can see that some of the data has been a little bit better. Central banks have been a bit more nuanced. They're su suggesting that you know, rate cuts are, are coming out of the markets. So they're going to be on hold for a period of time. And then we look straight away at what's happening in the fixed income market. I'm a big big watcher of what's happening in fixed income. I'm a big currency trader myself, but I watch what's happening in the fixed income market as a guide really for my, you know, for my currency trading as well. Um, we can see those positively trending equity markets. And obviously, people are looking at what's happening in liquidity there. But I'm having a look at what's happening in the yield curve. You can see that steepening, that radical steepening that's happening. And I'm thinking to myself, what's caused that? Well, you know, if you can understand what's caused that, and as I say, you're listening to what central banks say. And I think that's that's something that, that a lot of clients, and a lot of traders don't necessarily do is that they don't actually listen to what these guys are saying and, and which guys specifically you should be looking at. So for me, I go straight into the core of the Federal Reserve. Um, I listen to what Richard Clarid is saying. I listen to what Lal Branyard is saying. I'm listening to what Jerome Powell is saying to an extent. But the architects of Fed policy, I'm listening to what they're saying. What are they actually saying? And that's what markets are going to key off. Now, the fact is that they've, they've, they've said that they're going to leave policy um, unchanged for some time. And we've seen that steepening of the curve. So I'm saying to myself, do I want to um, trade the rates market? Do I want to trade um, curve steepeners? Do I want to trade dollar yen, which we can actually sort of go into into statistics and look at regression and actually see between certain currencies and, and, and various parts of the bond market? Um, and what is going to cause and how much further can it go? And of course, then it comes down to the data that's playing through in the market. Um, so I think in that situation, that's what I'm looking for. Also, you know, if, if we're going to see higher real yields because this, you know, what, what do I want to do with gold? Um, so I'm looking really at, you know, what are the central banks saying? What is the data telling me? 
Uh, and ultimately, then we sort of think drill into things like positioning as well and, and, and how that's sort of playing out. So that's really how I'm, how I'm identifying a trade. It's, it's, it's just really listening to what central bankers are saying, what the market is telling me. And if the central bankers are, are sensitive something, like, you know, they're talking about inflation quite a lot and, and inflation expectations, then I'm sensitive to it as well. And the market should be sensitive to it as well. And if you can understand that, then you, 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 can, you can pretty much hone into what assets you want to trade. Yeah, I wish more traders listened more. <laughs> it's, it's not always the case, but um, l let's talk about you. Let, let's stick with the macro theme of what the Fed is doing, because that's something that everybody can relate to, and it's pretty much impacting almost every market. Mm. And I think that there's one thing that I'm interested in hearing from you is, well, we all know about this this theme, right? Now, you have your own way that you look at it and figure out where the trade opportunity is. So how do you decide what market to trade? Because for someone like me, I'll use myself as an example. I only trade a couple of markets. I really trade 10 year ultras and I trade the S and P and maybe every now and then it'll be a gold trade or, or a crude trade, but those are not markets that I, I trade regularly. Mm. So I focus on what the macro themes are. And then I look to see how they're impacting my market. So I'm not choosing a market after I look at what's happening in the macro. Mm. To me, it sounds like you're looking for an opportunity once you have this macro theme. How, let's get specific here. How do you, let's talk about maybe a recent market that, that you decided to trade based upon what you've been seeing and hearing from the Fed. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really interesting situation. I mean, I, I love that, that, that sort of become a master of the trade rather than a sort of jack of all trades, which is some of the sort of, you know, you go into the investment banking model where, you know, you get a sales trader who's very, very specifically eyeing one market becomes a, a master of euro dollar or fed funds or, you know, G10 or, or G10 effects or whatever. And, and, and I like that model as well. But for me, um, you know, I'm sort of scouring around um, and, and trying to understand what is it that 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 I you know, what is it that, that that's really working and what's moving around and and you look for the first derivative, um, and so you know for example at the moment if you if you see what's happening the world is not so bad the central banks are telling us that the rate cuts are, you know that the barriers for further rate cuts are, 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 are you know significantly higher uh, and ultimately you know they're having diminishing returns. So the first derivative really of this is, is what's happening in, in rates markets. We're seeing, you know, like December 2020 um, Fed funds, the pricing out there, you know, we've got 37 basis points of cuts being priced in there. That was 130 odd basis points a number of weeks ago. So it's been a radical repricing coming through. And so, you know, do I look for the rates markets or do I go out and look at um, trading, for example, uh, three month treasuries? Uh, against 10-year treasuries and looking at a three-month 10-year curve, or do I go into dollar yen? I mean, I think you know, cost is obviously a big situation in there. Um, the spreads for dollar yen, for example, uh, obviously for me, it's, it's, it's cheaper and you can get better leverage than what you can do in in, in the, the fixed income market, for example, with with my broker. Um, but then again, it, you know, you could, then you'd look at what is the correlation. If the correlation between you know three-month 10-year and, and dollar yen is you know, less than, say, 0. 0.6 on the correlation coefficient, you know, I'm just going to go and trade the first derivative of that situation. But if I can see that, um, you know, dollar-yen, for example, has a very strong correlation with that, that that yield curve and it's cheaper for me to do so, then I'm going to go and do that. So, yeah, we're using statistics to sort of trade that that situation. But for me, yeah, you're looking at what is actually, uh, you know, getting a lot of attention, what's moving aggressively, uh, and, and then we're trying to work out, you know, what is the best asset based on on those statistical facts. Yeah, it makes sense. So what you're looking for after you have listened to the Fed, and we'll stay uh, specific with this macro theme, you're looking for where is the opportunity? Maybe because maybe some of those trades, they're already too far along. Everybody saw it. So maybe you say, you know what, I'm going to pass on that. Um, but you, so you're basically saying to me that you're looking to where maybe it hasn't played out yet. And that's where you go. Am I right in that thinking? Partly. But then, you know, if you look at what's happening in the S&P at the moment, um, you know, the S&P is at all-time highs. 
And the urge to go and short that market from a lot of retail is very high. You know, you want to be the guy at the, bat, at the pub who's getting a, bat, a pat on the back and saying, you know, you, you, you've shorted the market all time high as well done. You're a hero. To me, I'm looking at why that market is at all time high. So we've talked about what's happening in the yield curve, for example. But I also trade, you know, S&P, um, S&P futures. And, and I'm sort of, sort of going off a little bit off topic, but the um, – yeah, for me, I'm trying to understand why that market is at all-time highs. And, and it's not necessarily because interest rate expectations are coming out of the market. It's part of the reason why the S&P has done what it's done. For large parts of this year, there was this kind of no, there was no alternative trade going through. But then I'm sort of searching around, trying to understand why the equity market is where it is when earnings are coming down. We've got this earnings recession. We then look at the Fed's balance sheet, and we can see that the Fed's balance sheet has moved up, what, 200 or billion in the last couple of weeks as the repo operations are going through. And then we get a sense that actually equities are going up because of liquidity. Now, that's not something that's necessarily moving the yield curve. This is a completely different macro thematic. Um, so I, I like – I wouldn't say I'm a trend trader per se. I wouldn't say I'm necessarily a momentum trader. Um, but one of the first things I was taught in trading is that a market at all-time high is as bullish as it can possibly be. How can you say it's anything else? Now, of course, there's a way of trading reversals around 52-week um, highs and all-time highs. But immediately when, when I see – in the news that, that the S&P is all-time highs. Obviously, I've seen that from my charts anyway. I'm magnetized to that. I'm drawn to that. I want to know why it's there. And then I'm searching around, and I can see liquidity is driving the market. You know, you've seen money, global money supply is pretty much at an all-time high. The, the, the multi money multiplier or the credit impulse in China is moving higher. But the Fed's balance sheet is moving higher. Now, people are saying that's not QE. But the market is sensing that those better liquidity environment is, is helping the S&P. So I then look at my fundamentals and say, look, you know, forget about earnings, forget about where the valuation is of the market. We're trading 17 and a half times. It's expensive. But I'm looking at liquidity. What likes liquidity? Equities. So I'm in the S&P. I'm trading the S&P. It's at all time highs. People are saying, Chris, you can't go and put new money to work and buy a market that's at all time highs. And I'm saying, well, you know, you buy high, you sell higher. It's a kind of trend following momentum sort of style. But I, I'm looking around and I'm saying, can the Fed's balance sheet increase? Yes, maybe it's not QE, but the market's sensing that better liquidity environment is good for equity. Um, obviously, we're looking at what's happening in trade and the market's getting drip fed this positive US-China trade situation. And that may change. And that's obviously why you look at your risk profile and, and where to get out if, if the news flow turns decisively bearish. But I'm looking around, forget about the yield, the, yield, the yield curve trade that we've been talking about, what's happening in, in bond markets and various factors there. But for me, it's, it's when you see a market at all time high, I'm gravitating towards that, a market that's breaking out, a market that's moving and trending in the right direction. I want to know why. And for me, I'm looking around and I can see better liquidity dynamics, good for equities. I want to be long that market. And of course, then you sort of go into sort of how much, what's my position sizing, you know, how, how much I'm targeting, all those various factors that you have in trading. But, you know, I love that liquidity dynamic and, and, and what's working there as well. Interesting. So sometimes a, a macro theme can come from what you're seeing happening in a market, and then you look to see what's what's supporting that or not supporting that. Yeah, so we're talking about thematics. We talked about this sort of growth dynamic, this growth thematic that's been playing through, you know, will central banks support? And for a large period of this time, we're going to, we, we saw aggressive easing coming through global central banks, this supportive nature, and, and, and markets were buoyed up on that. The, the thematic that, that we're taking out of this one is, is, is somewhat different, is, is that we're seeing better liquidity dynamics. You know, if I, um, you know, have a look at M3 money supply, M2 money supply, for example, as I say, there's a very strong correlation between M2 money supply and the S&P. I can see that the Fed's balance sheet in the last couple of weeks has, has, has had a, rem a remarkable upturn, whether, you know, whether that's QE or not QE, you know, obviously you can debate, but the market has pushed up pretty much every time we've we've had the Fed coming out or the US Treasury coming out and issuing um you know, these, these, these SOMO uh, reports there. So, you know, for me, I, I'm taking that out as an individual thematic, which is this, this better liquidity dynamics um, and what's benefit there. Well, you can clearly see the, the correlation between the S&P and that money supply number. And, and so that is a sort of a thematic that's working in itself. When that thematic changes, um, you know, obviously I'll take a, a different view, but I've isolated that liquidity as a as being something that's very positive for U.S. equities and, and to an extent global equities. Certainly Chinese markets have done well um, and, and European equities have done quite nicely as well. So, you know, that, that's forming my bias. And of course, that's just creating the opportunity. There's a whole more, there's a whole world that, that comes around trading, not just, 
you know, getting into a trade and forming the idea, you know, that that's kind of half the half the battle won, of course. Um, but that that's what I'm looking. I'm isolating a thematic. Um, that thematic is is liquidity, and then I'm choosing a market which has been very sensitive to that, and I've correlated that with an over, overview. And then, you know, obviously, it then comes down to the other dynamics. Okay, we, we can work on thematics. I mean, I, I can I can have another look of uh, another example, which I think's been really interesting, um, and we've seen a lot of flow around it, which is Brexit and, and the UK election. That is a thematic in itself. So I might, as a as a, as a trader, look to um, look what's happening in in the pound. Uh, and, and trade that in isolation as well. Of course, what's happening in the UK election and, and, and Brexit news flow over the last couple of years hasn't resonated in things like the S&P, hasn't resonated in copper or bond markets globally outside of the gilt market. But that's a, that's an other idea of a, of a sort of special situation, trading situation that I might be in. Yeah. Uh, key word I think that you said was how sensitive a market was to a, a theme. And that's something that draws your eyes because if it's reacting to it, then at the end of the day, that's the most important thing. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah, yeah, hundred yeah. percent. I mean, if, if something, you know, something's not moving, um, you know, that that's telling you something in, in itself. It's Some, telling it yeah, itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah so, exactly. So I think when we're looking for a vehicle to trade, the market will. The market will tell you. I mean, I can come out and say that I think this is going to happen. But what we're looking for is, is is how sensitive. The market will tell you whether they're sensitive to it at the moment. You know, if you look at U.S.-China relations, for example, um, and it makes obvious sense. But the first thing you see is is um, dollar C and H. I'm 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 in in this U.S.-China relations, and you know, will we see a meeting? Will we not see a phase one agreement? What does it all mean? You know, are we going to see a full agreement ahead of the 2020 elections? Immediately, I'm thinking to myself, what's the best way to trade this? What's the best way to express that? And um, what does it mean for other markets? Now, the first thing I'm looking at is is is, is thing that anecdotally feels good for me and, and makes a lot of sense. So straight away, we go into dollar CNH, the onshore, the, sorry, the offshore remember. And we can see that that has a strong correlation with, with um, Aussie dollar and also to an extent euro dollar. Uh, and that makes some sense because Australia is is a big trading partner of China and um, you know, Australia, while well, we, you know, we've been cutting rates, the Aussie dollar has been a, a vehicle for traders just to trade uh, emerging markets and obviously this situation as well. Um, but then ultimately, there's other markets which are sensitive to moves in dollar C and H. But for me, you know, you go to the first derivative. And so dollar C and H has been very, very sensitive to any news flow that we've been seeing that. So that would be the first starting point that I'll be going for. And when the market has shown you time and time again that they will react using dollar C and H uh, as a vehicle for trading this, then yeah, that, that's going to be where I'm going to be looking for. Watching the reactions, I love it. I think very similar, even though I'm a day trader, I think that way about what my trading is, is yeah. watching the reactions are very important. Well, you're and trading now, the reactions, aren't you, at the end of the day? I mean, that's that's yeah. kind of what we, we can prophesize. Um, but a lot of what I do is not, not a, you know, you can prophesize, but you need to be making sure that um, you're reactionary as well. And it's the reactions which I think, you know, tell you the collective faults of the market that we, we are trading the aggregated thoughts and, and ebb and flow of the market, the supply and demand in the market. And and when you know, markets are, you can say they're a voting mechanism, um, we need to understand what that reaction is. And that tells you a lot about the psychology. And we can analyze that psychology to try and help us with our probabilities. You know, what's interesting is that on social media, it seems like so many people are trying to fade the reaction that's really happening. You know, they're trying to go against it because their theme is saying this shouldn't be happening, but this is happening. Yeah, no, I agree. And I, I think there's just, well, there's a lot of people that were natural counter trenders uh, in markets and bits and pieces. But yeah, I mean, if you, if you listen to what, what, what central banks trying to say, um, if you listen to what the market's telling you, um, you know, they, they got, of course, timing's always key, you know, and where do you get in? Where do you get out? That's 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 a fundamental part of the trading process. But um, you know, I think not enough people actually listen to what what the market's telling you, uh, what the central banks are saying, what politicians are saying, and actually really fully understand that. Now that that may hurt. That might because <laughs> there's a lot of noise and 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 you know commentary that you should probably avoid. But ultimately, I think you know over time, if you, if you're listening to what some of the core members are saying, you know it can really work in your favour. Hey everybody, I want to take a moment to thank one of our sponsors, FTSE Russell. 
They are a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. The Russell 2000 Index is a key benchmark for small cap U.S. stocks. Be sure to check out the E-mini Russell 2000 Index Futures, contract symbol RTY. For more information on FTSE Russell and their products, please visit FTSERussell.com. Let's talk about execution now. So I, I think everybody understands how you identify a theme and then choose a market to trade. Mm-hmm. But let's talk about how you execute once you've chosen a market to trade. The next thing that you mentioned that was part of your overall process was using technical analysis and then risk management. Mm-hmm. Give us a recent example, if you could, of you identifying a macro theme choosing a market and then what technical analysis you looked at and how you risk managed that trade. Well, I can go, I can give you a, a very recent, um, uh, example. Um, we've been seeing a, a, a radical steepening of the curve, which we identified to clients a while back, um, as to what this all means has, has the world improved. We think it's, not really improved, but we think it's less bad. Central bankers under the Fed meeting recently have suggested that, um, you know, that they, they're not going to tighten policy until inflation gets much higher, which is obviously anchoring things to an extent. But ultimately, they're on a, on a long pausing cycle. And a lot of the interest rate has come out of the market. So we've been looking um, at the three month 10 year, we've been looking at things like um, three year three month treasuries relative to five year five year forward rates. Um, and we've seen a, a steepening, so a big underperformance from long end rates. Um, and rather than play play the yield curve, I've wanted to trade dollar yen. And we've seen a really nice move up in, in dollar yen. Now, if you have a look at the daily chart or weekly chart or four hour chart, you've seen that that move of into sort of 109. There's been a really strong level of horizontal resistance over the last couple of well, last month or two. There's been a couple of fake outs through 109. Um, but what we wanted to see um, was this idea that that traders were going to continue bidding this up. Now, I wanted to buy dollar yen, um, and we waited for the daily close above 109, and that tells you a lot. You know, I wait for closes above a certain level to tell me that that that, that, that the buyers have the emphasis to actually close above a level. Uh, I'm giving you an example of what, what appears to be a losing trade at the moment. <laughs> I'm not one of those guys who necessarily says, oh, I'm only a winner. But, um, you know, we, so we saw a daily close above 109. We started trading through that level of supply, which is which has failed uh, pretty miserably. Uh, ideally, you want to wait for it. I'd wait for and wait for a weekly close. But, you know, we've seen that steepening of the curve. I thought there was more juice in that. Um, and we saw the, the, the close through that level. I've entered a trade. Oh, we can talk about the other the other aspects of bits and pieces. But now that trade's come back a little bit. We've seen people looking to fade that curve move. But I got into the trade with the idea that, you know, we've seen a number of tests of 109. Um, it's closed through that level there. And that's told me a lot about the semantics in the trade. And therefore, you know, I think that we could probably make a move into 110, 112. Uh, sorry, 110, perhaps even a little bit higher as we've got more juice left in this uh, in, in this yield curve steepening trade. We've actually seen it come back a little bit, and we can talk about the stop loss process and, and the position sizing a bit. But the whole rationale for me getting in the trade was the idea that we, you know, we'd, we'd seen that steepening the curve. Dolly Yen had gone along for the ride and moved up quite nicely with that, as rate cuts have been priced out of the market. And then what we saw is this 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 continued situation where Dolly Yen had been faded around 109, and when we actually got the close above that, that told me a lot about the psychology of the market. What? Technical analysis tools are you specifically using? Yeah, so I'm, I'm keeping things very simple. Um, I'm assessing probability at all time, and and from that perspective, I don't need to go into to, to really hardcore technicals. As I say, I've got a process where I'm looking at probability, not just on in in terms of thematics and and what markets I should be trading, and the probability of those continuing to go in one direction, but also when I'm in a position. Um, and, and assessing the risk around that and the probabilities of various uh, permutations of those uh, of, of those risks coming to fruition and what it means for the trade that I'm in. So when I'm actually looking at a, a position and when I'm in a position and, and 
what I'm looking for is really very a very simple situation. I, if I'm bullish on a market, I want to say that the market is structured bullish as well. So I'm looking at the overall feel. I look at weekly charts. Every Sunday, I look at all the positions I've got. I look at all the positions that are on my watch list, and I'm looking at weekly charts. The weekly chart will give me a really strong ebb and feel the rhythm and rhyming of the market, you know, how the market is positioned and structured, the primary trend in the market. And that tells me a lot about my macro situation and then the technical things around that. What are the, I'll probably maybe use the, at, a, at an oscillator level, I'll probably just use a stochastic um, indicator and that's about it. The rest of it's down to some, some basic moving averages and then just really just the look at the chart and the feel of the chart. I might use horizontal resistance levels, uh, support levels, but it's it's very very basic stuff. Um, I'm I'm just looking at the rhyme and feel. I'm a big believer in price action analysis, so I'm looking at candles. I'm looking at you know the aggregation of flow. You know that when you're looking at a chart, what is it telling you? Um, you know how is the market behaving? So I'm more a price action guy. And in terms of technicals, it's very very basic. I just want to know the structure of, of the market. When I'm actually coming to execute, I might take the time uh, time frame in a bit. But I've got my my macro oversight. Um, I apply a weekly time frame to get that sort of rhythm and feel, make sure that sort of rhymes and aligns with what I'm doing on a macro basis. And then I sort of drill in for execution. But ultimately, you know, very basic technicals, just trying to understand the trend. And then it comes into sort of price action as well. Something that I know you use is implied volatility. I know that because you told me yeah, right. <laughs> but yeah. it, as a core input for your risk assessment and correct position sizing. Yeah. Talk to us about that. Yeah, look, for me, um, you know, there's, there's, we can use, a lot of, a lot of people will use realized volatility or historic volatility, um, uh, predominantly for, as a risk management tool. You know, how many people go out there who are probably listening to this um, would use a, a, an average true range, a five day average true range to understand their position sizing. You might, might leave a stop loss one, one and a half times ATR, for example. That's sort of a classic situation. Uh, and yeah, that's fine. If, if that works for you, that works for you. If that gets you an edge, that gets you an edge. Happy days. Um, but for me, uh, volatility is the is is the epicenter of the financial markets. Um, volatility defines your strategy. It defines your um, risk. It defines your position sizing. You know, for example, if you've got very high volatility in in, in financial markets, whether you're looking at the VIX, whether you're looking at um, individual G10 effects, implied volatility or realized volatility um, or, or whatever, you know, whether you're in oil or, or uh, looking at volatility in gold, for example, ultimately it will define your strategy. For example, um, if you see very low volatility, positive trending equity markets, you're going to see people looking to go into carry. That's one of my thematics. So as we're standing at the moment, we've got the VIX trading just below 13 um, percent. You've got the S&P at all time highs buyers of dips, people are buyers of dips, and, and therefore we want to be paid to be in a position. When you've got that low vol, um, people want to go in, into carry. So I'm, immediate, I'm looking at, as a thematic, I'm trying to understand this, this carry trade. What is the right carry vehicle for me to get in? And, and, and then we adapt the, the technical view. Is it going up? And is the market agreeing with me in that situation as well? So volatility defines your strategy. Higher volatility, you tend to be people going towards the yen, to the Swiss franc, going into treasuries, going into flatter curves, duration, those, those, those factors as well. So volatility defines your strategy. Now, for me, and I put out a weekly report every, uh, you know, uh, every, every Friday and Monday for the, for on this situation. But rather than me trying to understand what the market thinks about volatility and what they think about the week ahead, I let, them, uh, I let the market tell me what they think. I let the, the, the collective thoughts. And therefore, implied volatility is really key. So I look at, for example, if I'm in effects positions, um, I, I will look at uh, one week implied volatility uh, or one month implied volatility, but mostly one, one week. And what the, the implied volatility is telling me, it's an annualized standard deviation move over, a, 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 over one year, but you can break that down into weekly. Um, and you can look at that where that, that volatility is in, in, in context of, of 12 months or, or three, three years, for example. Um, but that implied volatility, when you break it down into, into various option strategies, um, you can actually work out categorically um, the expected move over a specific time frame. So, for example, you can go in at the beginning of the week and have a look at an Aussie dollar one week straddle. And that tells me 
the theoretical price or the expected move up or down in the Australian dollar um, over a one week period with a, a 68.2% level of confidence. You can actually then take that out um, and look at, for example, 10 delta straddles or strangles and actually look at a market. What is an extreme move? What is the market saying is an extreme move over this period, you know, with a 10% chance of this being in the money? So rather than me going out and saying, what do I expect this week? I'm looking at the market telling me, and that's what implied volatility does. When I use that implied volatility into the Black Shoals and it works out what the expected move is, yeah, that is incredibly powerful for me. You know, in a situation recently where we had, um, you know, Sterling was, had a very, very high implied volatility because everyone was like, well, what does this all mean? You know, are we going to get this hard Brexit? Are we not going to get hard Brexit? What does a hard Brexit look like? And, you know, when you can't price risk accordingly, you get very high implied volatility and you get massive moves in price. Um, and what that told me is, is I didn't want to be involved in that. It's too high for me. And if I did, then I want to keep my position size really, really, really low. Um, and what we're seeing at the moment is a situation where implied volatility in markets is very, very low. You can then extrapolate what the expected moves are. So buyers and sellers of volatility, if you're using straddles and strangles, get an explicit level to trade by. And I can use that number as a guide for how, my, how far away my stop loss is going to be and how much risk I'm going to take in the market. And if that number is a low number on a relative basis, I know that I can have a tighter stop. And therefore, my position size can be you know, slightly higher, for example. Obviously, if that number's big and the market's saying that we expect a big move and you can categorically use the options market to determine that, um, then my position size is going to be adjusted accordingly. So the great thing about implied volatility and what's really good about the options market is the whole thing is based on math and it, and it uses specific numbers by which we can trade off. And what I can use for my own trading is things like spot FX. Uh, and, and things like gold and everything like that is, is what is the market expecting? And we can understand what the market's expecting. I think that's more powerful than, than having my own belief. But what it does is it gives you a defined level by which you can, you know, you, you're expecting a move over the time. Now, that market might be wrong, but, you know, we all can be wrong. But I use that as a, as a, a defined way of, 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 of understanding how much risk I can take on. Um, and then, you know, you can obviously work out your position sizing accordingly to that. So I want to just do a quick recap when we're looking at your trading process. It starts off with developing a macro theme, mm -hmm. right? And then from there, you're going to look at the market to where you see the opportunity. You're, you're watching the reactions to the macro theme, or it could be the market is initially what gives you an idea to look into macro into a macro theme, and then you decide whether or not you want to trade that. Am I right so far? Yeah, exactly. Then you look at general technical analysis. You mentioned weekly charts, and you're just looking to see whether or not this market is in a trend, supporting or basically contradicting what you're seeing in the macro theme. 100%, right? yeah, yeah. So weekly and daily charts, really, yeah. Then you go and use implied volatility as your core input for your risk assessment and your position sizing. 100%. Did I miss anything out, out of that process? No, no, that, that, that's, that, I mean, you're, that, that's the, the, int the entry of a, of a trade, I guess. You know, the, the, the next part is, well, I guess, well, we probably don't have a huge amount of time to talk about it, but, you know, the, as one of the, the, the biggest and gravest and one of the hardest parts of being a discretionary trader is, is how you're managing the position when you're in the trade. I mean, that, that to me is, um, is incredibly difficult uh, and something that, that has taken many, many years to try and block out. Where do I find the noise? Uh, where do I source my information? What am I looking at um, and, and what affects me as a trader? And I think, you know, that's what really separates the institutional guys from, from the retail guys in a lot of the cases is how do they deal with an open position? And I think that the, the next thing is really, how do I learn? How do I learn? Well, you know, for me, and I think this is, this is something which are not, a lot, not enough people do, is the idea at the end of the week, you know, I actually sit down and, and, and actually properly analyze what I've done and where I've done wrong. And, and my school belief, and this comes back to one of the things that I, 
you know, I learned very early on, one of my sort of early mentors uh, in London taught me is that if something works in your life, you do more of it. If something doesn't work in your life, you do less of it. So why can't we adopt the same situation in trading? And this comes down to the idea at the end of the week, I'm trying to understand what I've done well and can I repeat it or can I repeat that? And and I'm trying to cut out the things that I've done you know, less well and making sure that, you know, I'm optimizing that. I've got a strategy which I believe works. It gives me an edge. It gives me a positive expectancy. Um, but I'm also... I'm trying to understand as a discretionary trader what I've done really well and trying to replicate and do more of that action. And I think that's something. So it's not just about being in the trade, but it's also, I think, you know, this this idea of of continuous education, continuous learning um, and, and trying to do more of what works for me, I think, is, is something that as a discretionary trader is, is, is I want to say, underappreciated because I know everyone does think about it. Um, but I think, you know, that that's something that I, I, I spend a lot of time on. It's so funny you're saying this because I literally just put a tweet out the other day talking specifically about this. I mean, one of the ways for me that I feel is helped me become not only just in trading, but as a better person. Mm. And obviously, because we're this is a trading show to become a better trader is do more of what works and less of what doesn't. Yeah. It's simple, but powerful and effective. Well, I just think there's a, there's a lot of laziness in trading, you know, and and the you know if you go into you go into like, you go into that show billions, right? <laughs> you've got yeah, it, it's just a great thing. You've got a coach who who works in this hedge fund industry who who will sit there and and, and analyze your trading. How did you feel emotionally? You know what is going on in your life at that stage. You you were you were a crap trader at this stage. What did you do about poorly? And you've got someone who's doing that for you. Uh, you know, and mostly on a on a on a retail level or, or someone who's doing this for themselves. We don't have that luxury of having someone do it. You've got to do it yourself. And this is where the laziness comes in. Not enough people can actually spend the time to, to go through their journal. And it can be quite difficult. You know, if, you, if you've got a system which you know, does a, a lot of trading, um, especially the scalpers of this world and, the, you know, the, the, the sort of higher frequency guys, you know, to actually go through that can be quite time consuming. Um, and ultimately, you know, they're just going to look at their equity curve and their drawdown and, and their risk adjusted returns to, to see how, how that all plays out. But for me, someone who, who might do four or five trades a week, it's not, you know, um, the ability for me to sort of sit down and, and document not not just where I went right, but where I went wrong into sort of finite details like, you know, what session did I, what session have I done better in? Do I trade better in the US trading session or do I trade better in the Asian trading session when, when you know, volatility subsides and we're a bit more reactionary? You know, I can, I can, there's a lot of information I can take out there that makes me a better trader. But I think part of the reason why not enough do people do this is they just don't take the time to sit down and actually go through this part. It's all the, the sexy part of trading, which is finding opportunity and executing the, for me, the, the actual part is actually trying to learn from from that process. And, and yeah, we just can't be lazy traders. I couldn't agree with you more. And for those out there that maybe haven't started that process of self-awareness, self-evaluation, once I started doing that and focusing more energy on that, I became addicted to it. Yeah. You know, I'm always evaluating myself. We could go on and on all day about this. <laughs> Just great insight so far today, Chris. But we're not done yet. I have rapid fire questions next if you're ready for those. That's right. All right, everybody. Our rapid fire segment is sponsored by Trading Technologies. Trade the global markets with TT, the world's fastest commercially available futures trading platform. Now with integrated tools for advanced options trading, cryptocurrencies, and trade surveillance. You can try it now for free at tryttnow.com. Chris, first question for you. What trader has influenced your life the most and why? Um, probably some of the ones I had in the early years when I was working in some U.S. banks in London. I'm not going to name names. Uh, that's a long time ago. Probably recently a guy called Nick Raj works at the Chartist in Australia. I uh, went on the road with him for many years uh, doing a lot of seminars and bits and pieces. Um, more on the systematic side, so not some, something I represent, but I think some of the insights – um, and, and, you know, thoughts about taking profits and, and realizing the best traders are the best losers, you know, fascinated me in the late, in late 2000s. So, yeah, he was a, a, a big mentor of mine. What was one of the hardest things for you to overcome in trading? Uh, I think over analysis, you know, for me, it's uh, as a guy who sort of studies multiple markets, it's, you know, just focus, just going into too much depth and, and forgetting, you know, that the, the ebb and flow tells you a lot about what's going on as well. So, yeah, probably the the, the over analysis and, 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 and you know, reading into too, too much things there. 
How has your trading process evolved over the years? Uh, well, I think probably the in, the introduction of um, implied volatility um, uh, and, and studying the options market in, in that capacity and, and, and what the market is telling me they expect and not what I expect um, and, and being able to use that, that definitive number. Um, for my risk uh, and my position sizing, I think it's probably the thing that's that, that's really worked um, quite nicely, and not just implied volatility for my strategy and what what assets I'm going to be sort of biased towards, but ultimately how I can use that to really heighten my risk um, risk assessment. What is one attribute that you believe every trader should have? I want to say patience. <laughs> I know it's a cliche and everyone bangs on about it on social media, but for me, um, it, it really is something that I look at. So, for example, if I have my macro strategy, if I have my macro overlay, my bias, and I say this is the vehicle that I want to trade, but the technicals are not there, well, I'm not going to trade that. I want to wait for the market conditions. If I'm early with my view um, and the market hasn't warmed up to it and that body of, of capital is not moving in motion, um, and, and aligning if I'm fighting a trend with my view, I'm not going to trade that. So I've, I want to wait for the market to come round to that. So that that for me is the situation is, is I want to align my fundamental, my macro view with the with the market structure. Uh, if that's not there, then I've got to wait for that. So I think patience for me is is is, is a key virtue for me. Favorite book about trading? Uh, I don't have one. To be honest. Uh, not that I've um, off, off the top of my head. There's some, yeah, I don't know. I think some of the ones I read uh, around volatility, but I can't remember the, the exact, exact name, sorry. If you had to pick a profession other than trading, what would it be? Um, really, I think over the last decade, I've become fascinated. And, and I think this has really accelerated through 2012 onwards when we saw the European debt crisis into the US political situation. And now really with Brexit, I know it's like pulling teeth and it's really painful for a lot of people, but a politician, um, it's not say I, I've got a, a, a two face or anything, but I, I find not just how markets interact with, with um, political events and how poor we are at pricing risk and the probability outcomes around that. But, you know, I, I, I think I find the whole sort of way that, that they interact and, and, and what, what happens and what they're trying to achieve and how they interact with not just the political base and various parts of the political base, but I find that fascinating as well. What's the best piece of advice that you received about trading? Uh, well, I want to say uh, a market at all-time highs or 52-week highs is bullish and therefore should be traded as such. You're either long or you're neutral, but you don't short the market at all-time highs. I think that's, that is something that continues to work. If I, I, and I single out equity in the indices and the S&P, for example, um, but it works. And, and that's something that was taught to me at a very early age is that, Chris, keep things real simple. Yeah, market at all-time highs, forget why it's there, but you can't be any more bullish than that. Don't fade a market at all-time highs. I think, you know, we can go into it. There's obviously a lot more science involved in that, why it's there and all those factors. But, you know, for me, if you'd looked at that in the last through the QE years and the liquidity years and what we're at now, I mean, it serves you pretty well. If you could go back in time and give the younger you a piece of advice, what would it be? I love the idea of of, of not over-celebrating. Um, you know, I think, yeah, a lot of people when they first get into trading are just, oh, I made, made money here, I made money here. Um, and you know, I think that can really mess around with your psyche, especially when you're a discretionary trader. Um, you know, the idea of over celebrating a win is something that can really come back to hit you, especially when you're still honing in your strategy and, and the idea of over celebrating can lead to, you know, increased position sizing and, and taking away the discipline. If you, if you do have a strategy around that risk management, as I say, my position sizing is, 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 is determined by implied volatility, um, and the distance to my stop loss and various factors, um, and the asset I'm trading as well. But, uh, you know, the idea that, you know, a lot of people will over-celebrate the wins, start having a series of wins, and that messes around with their psyche and their position sizing. So I think, you know, just being able to being able to take that win and move on, I think is, is a really big one. If you had an elevator pitch me your edge in trading, what would you say? Well, my, my strategy is, is looking um, at probability. We can never be right. We can never always be right but we're always looking for the probabilities. Now, my system and my edge looks at probability from a two-pronged perspective, not just um, the entry and the opportunity, but also when we're in a position and looking at the probability scales 
of, of, of various event risks taking place. Uh, and how that means for our position. So I'm looking at my my edge is really looking at the markets both from an opportunity and from a an open position perspective, and taking a really holistic view, looking at positioning, looking at risk reversals, looking at skew, as I say, um, and looking at implied volatility to give me that really holistic view um, to look at probability. And 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 really my whole thesis of trading is is really about probability and the outcomes there. Last question for today, Chris. What's your favorite thing to do when you're not working? Uh, well, I obviously say sport, watching sport. Um, but I think it's really just um, stopping my one and, and four-year-old from smashing up the house and, and causing my wife any more grief than she has to, she has to face through me. <laughs> Chris, where can people find you on social media and give us a website to check out? Uh, my website's just my company one, uh, www.pepperstone.com. Um, but you can find me on uh, at Chris Weston underscore PS. Um, I put out a daily research piece on you know various macro factors, really looking at breaking down the event risk and looking at probabilities and and things like the implied volatility metrics. So that might be something that that, that could interest you as well. Um, but yeah, reach out to me on on Twitter and, and you know join in the uh, join in the debate. Chris, great insight. Thank you so much for joining me today on Futures Radio Show. No, my pleasure. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you have any questions or comments for myself or my guests, please visit futuresradioshow.com and sign up to be a premium member for free. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes.